So, would you push the button or just let it be? Here are 19 reasons to read Gwendy's Button Box. Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Dave Musson, at Dave Musson on Instagram, and this is the place where I'm taking you through the works of Stephen King in chronological order and giving you 19 reasons to read each of his books. If that sounds like something you would like more of, do click around the rest of my channel, see what else you can find. As you can see, we're up to Gwendy's button box now, so there's lots of book episodes to explore, and there's lots of specials as well, where you can get your teeth into a whole range of different things. Off the top of my head, which one would I recommend right now? Ooh, maybe my special on Stephen King and music, which I posted a couple of weeks ago. So this week, we're up to 2017 and Gwendy's Button Box, a cute little novella that ended up spawning two sequels, the second of which, Gwendy's Final Task, came out earlier in 2022 and you can catch my spoiler-free review of it elsewhere on my channel. While we're talking spoilers, there will be spoilers in this video but I will save them to the end and I will give you warning when they're coming so if you need to dip out before they come, you can do exactly that. But otherwise, let's chow down on a chocolate animal and jump into 19 Reasons to Read, Wendy's Button Box. So this is a collaboration between Stephen King and Richard Chismar. Chismar? Chismar? Let's go with Chismar. The man behind Cemetery Dance Publications, a guy who seems genuinely really, really nice and likeable, and one of the luckiest men in the planet. Not only is he friends with King, but he's gotten to write a couple of books with the guy too. That's a pretty good deal. And for what it's worth, the two of them together work really nicely. So this started life as an idea that Stephen King had, but he couldn't really work out where to take it. So he showed it to Richard Chismar. Chismar came back with a few suggestions. King came back with a few more suggestions. And pretty soon they were collaborating and they ended up writing the whole thing in a month. Now regulars around here will know that I don't have a great history on previous King collaborations, particularly those two books he co-authored with Peter Straub, The Talisman and Black House, which sit very firmly at the bottom of my overall King ranking. Now this one, while it's nowhere near as ambitious or epic, for me is actually a much tighter, neater, cleaner and far more enjoyable read. So a big pull for King fans on this one is its location. Yep, it's a Castle Rock story, everyone. This is our first extended stay in Castle Rock since Needful Things. Sure, we've gone there for a couple of short stories in between, but never really stayed more than a few pages. Hmm, maybe I should do a special on Castle Rock stories at some point. Maybe? Let me know in the comments if you'd like that. So this is a novella and it's a breezy read. I mean, look at the layout and the font sizes. This is designed to just keep you turning those pages and getting through. And the story is good enough and punchy enough to do exactly that. If you're looking for a quick, satisfying shot of King, this is your book. And this one is also a 70s piece. It starts in 1974, fun fact, same year that Carrie was published. And well, we all know King in a small town in some sort of mid-century period, that's onto a winner, right? So what's the hook in this one? Well, our main character is 12-year-old Gwendy Peterson, who has decided during the summer holidays to take up running every day in an attempt to lose some weight so that the other kids will stop calling her Goodyear after the Goodyear blimp. Harsh fuckers. Every day, she runs up and down what is known as the suicide stairs in Castle Rock. One day, she reaches the top of the stairs, looks over, and sees a man in a black suit with a black bowler hat sitting on a bench who wants her to come over and have a palaver. This man's name is Richard Farris. He ends up giving Gwendy the button box, which is this box with buttons on top and levers on the side. The buttons represent each continent plus a red one and a black one, while the levers dispense magical tasty chocolate animals and equally magical and highly valuable silver dollars. Faris leaves the box in Gwendy's possession and vanishes, leaving her with this box to look after and try and resist its temptations of pushing the buttons and also leaving her with lots of nightmares of Richard Farris's hat. Who'd have thought bowler hats would be scary? So while the buttons are sketchy and 
something not to be touched. The levers, as I've mentioned, are pretty good. They give out these valuable silver dollars, which Gwendy is able to make use of later, and these special chocolates, which taste absolutely amazing, look wonderful and intricate, and can basically cure you of any ailment. Pretty soon, Gwendy loses weight, stops having to wear glasses, becomes an all-star athlete and general popular girl in school, and it's all thanks to the chocolates. Well, mainly. Not only all of that, Gwendy's parents, whose relationship has become a bit rocky at this point, they patch things up. They fall in love completely all over again. Those chocolates really know how to work their stuff, don't they? So those buttons, yeah, they're tempting. And, well, eventually, Gwendy does give in. And I'll save that for the spoilers section. But safe to say, those things are the real deal. So over the rest of the book, we see Gwendy fall in love, get in some sticky situations, go off to college, do all of those white girl in America being successful things. It's a nice breezy read, kind of surprising that there was enough here to spawn two sequels, but hey, I'm not in the publishing business. What do I know? Check, check. Just checking my new microphone was working. Okay, I think it's time we jumped into the spoilers, so if you need to leave here, do so. So if you need to leave... <laughs> Right, it's time to jump into those spoilers. So if you need to leave here, grab a chocolate and I'll see you again soon. And if not, stick around because we've got more reasons to read Gwendy's Button Box. Okay, let's go back to Richard Farris, the man in black who wants to palaver with the initials RF. It's flag, surely. And yet, flag giving something to Gwendy that benefits her with seemingly no ulterior motives? Maybe it isn't flag, but then there's the temptation of those buttons and that very much does sound like flag That twisty little fucker to put the buttons that could Potentially not just end this world, but all worlds in front of this young girl and ask her to just look after it Yeah, that sounds very very flag-esque when we think about it So I mentioned earlier that Gwendy does try a button She tries the South America button and thinks particularly of the country Guyana, which she looked up in an atlas at school. She pushes that button thinking of Guyana and fucking Jonestown happens. Yeah, safe to say Gwendy leaves those buttons alone for quite some time after all of that. This book doesn't have too many dark moments, but one of its darkest moments is when Gwendy's best friend Olive commits suicide by jumping off the suicide stairs. Gwendy is devastated by this and uses one of the magic buttons on the box to destroy the staircase and most of the cliff that it's attached to. Oh, and she also uses the box to kill a psychopath who had hidden in her closet and murdered her boyfriend and uses the box to help dispose of the body. Very handy little thing this is. So after that exciting but admittedly a little predictable sequence, the book kind of meanders through to its end. We see Gwendy go off to college, she pays for her education with the silver dollars, she becomes less reliant on the chocolates and things just kind of wind down to a natural course. Now, that might sound like I'm saying it peters out. It really doesn't. The story is still strong enough to keep you there. And rather than just petering out, as I say, it just feels like we're coming slowly to a natural stop. It works. So then, boom, 10 years later, and Richard Farris appears again, right when Gwendy's about to leave college. And he takes back the box. And they sit down and have some cake together. Yeah, I know and they chat about what had gone down while the box was in Gwendy's possession. Now, Farris, Flag, whatever we're calling him, he reassures Wendy that Jonestown was not her fault and that Olive's suicide was not her fault, and that actually her ability to not push those buttons averted many, many tragedies. Now, this is all well and good, but who the fuck are you and what the fuck have you done with Randall fucking Flag? okay? This is not the villain we signed up for. What is going on, Richard Farris? RF? Hmm. RF. Has anybody ever looked into Roger Federer? I mean, can anybody be that good for that long? And, let's face it, that RF logo that he started rolling out in the last few years in his career, that was so hideously shit, it had to be the work of the devil, right? So finally, aside from the obvious Easter egg of being in Castle Rock, there's a few other things to look out for if you are a constant reader. Lots of little things to tickle your fancy. We hear some familiar names like Bannerman and Desjardins, 
And there's also a reference to a kite being flown shortly before a tragedy, which made me think of Pet Cemetery. Not only that, there was a reference of something floating against the wind, like we see in It. There's a reference to Dark Score Lake, which is from Bag of Bones. And there's also a nod to a rape murder in Cleves Mill, which is almost certainly the work of Frank Dodd in The Dead Zone. For so few pages, that's quite a few Easter eggs. I think you'll agree. So there we go, 19 reasons to read Gwendy's Button Box, and one random musing about a retired tennis player. You just never know what you're going to get on this channel, do you? So if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do. Who knows what I'll come up with next time. Oh, and don't forget to let me know what you think of Gwendy's Button Box in the comments. And hey, let me know where you would rank it in the trilogy. For me, it's probably just about my favourite of the three. Just. If you enjoyed that, and you haven't been here before, then do explore the rest of my channel. I've got videos for all of the books up to and including Gwendy's Button Box and some specials as well, including the one video that continues to outperform everything else on this channel, my ultimate guide to the Dark Tower, which you can check out right now and let me know what you think of. And hey, as I mentioned earlier, click subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. And I think think given that I've been doing this YouTube thing for a couple of years now I'm probably supposed to tell you to hit the bell to get notifications and stuff like that but hey it's your life do what you want you don't even have to subscribe but if you like King and you like hearing a random guy from England who swears a bit too much and has fairly basic opinions but is consistent in his scheduling then this is the channel for you definitely that's it next time we've got another collaboration and friends, it is not a good one. See you for that. Boom.